Good morning, and thank you for joining the New York City Accelerators Build the for the Future State of New Construction webinar. My name is Michael Berry. I am the new building track lead for the New York City Accelerator, and I'll be moderating today's panel. We are very excited for today's webinar as we've assembled a great cross-section of presenters that will be discussing different areas of the state of new construction in the city. Today's panels include my colleague, Eric Jacobs from the New York City Accelerator. We'll also be joined by Kendrick Chai Hung and Holly Savoye from the Department of Buildings who will be providing a policy overview on Local Law 97, Local Law 92 and 94, and Local Law 154. Michael Schmidt from Stephen Winters Associates will be discussing the work he and his team did on the largest affordable passive house uh, project in the world, Sandro Verde. Robert Holbrook from the Mayor's Office of Policy and Planning will be providing information on the work he is doing to support commercial to residential conversions in the city today. After the panel is presented, we'll have time for Q&A, so we would encourage each of you to add any questions you may have during today's presentation into the chat window. We are now going to do a live poll with some questions to solicit feedback from you on where we can be best continue to support the building community in New York City. So if you could take a minute to provide feedback now, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, for some reason, if you're not seeing or you're having difficulties, please uh, 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 let us know through the chat as well. If you could uh, start to wrap up your responses, that would be greatly appreciated. And. Um, once we have everyone's uh, poll uh, results in, we'll be sharing those on the screen. All right, I think we're gonna wrap up and here are the results. So it uh, looks like we've got a great cross section of attendees today throughout the building industry. So uh, thank you for that. Um, looks like also um, that we are seeing that there is definitely some need in the city for some financial um, um, incentives and support uh, for our, uh, as one of the biggest challenges to electrifying buildings. Um, seems like if everyone had a magic wand, which you all would like to have, um, it sounds like that utility incentives and rate structure, tax credits, and city and state financial incentives would be of interest uh, to folks participating today. And then um, from each of your perspective, um, the New York City marketplace is missing in terms. Uh, it looks like the biggest area again is financing, seeing a, a theme here. Um, and then obviously the need for our trainings uh, technical support and playbooks, and then any vetted service providers or contractors we could provide. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the poll. Um, this was uh, great, and we uh, will be applying this feedback to um, our track and, and the New York City Accelerator. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to be uh, kicking off today's presentation, talking about the New York City Accelerator, and then be handing over to my colleague, Eric Jacobs, uh, who will be talking about the uh, new buildings track. So New York City is on a pathway to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. In New York City, 68% of the city's emissions come from buildings. And by 2050, 90% of these buildings will still be standing in the city. That means to reach carbon neutrality, by 2050, we need to tackle the largest contributor of carbon emissions in the city, which are our buildings. The city has passed a series of decarbonization policies, including the Climate Mobilization Act of 2019. The city supports programs like the New York City Accelerator, offering free technical assistance and fostering economic development um, as we work towards meeting New York City's 
ambitious climate goals. The New York, City, New York City Accelerator is a program to help building owners, property managers, developers, and other decision makers work towards energy and carbon reduction goals. The program is part of the city's long-term goals to help the market transform how our buildings are, operate and are built. A few ways the program works in the market include providing technical assistance to help buildings interpret their energy benchmarking and audit results, deliver expert advice to determine requirements and help meet local energy laws, using those results to identify which building upgrades to implement ranging from smaller projects like lighting retrofits to large ones such as installing new heating equipment or replacing your roof, delivering general guidance on how to sequence and prioritize your building upgrades and energy conservation measures, to providing RFI and RFP templates to solicit proposals from service providers and contractors. And lastly, an important part of the program is connecting buildings to finan financing opportunities and financial incentives to fund their building upgrades. And as we saw by the poll, this was a very important area to everyone who's joined today. Sorry, it's a delay in my slides. Um, so who is, el who is eligible for the New York City Accelerator? Um, anyone who's working on a privately owned new buildings in the city that are greater than 5,000 square feet, we can assist through our program track. Um, we also support existing buildings, affordable buildings, multifamily and commercial buildings, industrial properties and houses of worship throughout the city. All you have to do is reach out to the New York City Accelerator team my colleague Eric will be sharing some contact information, which we'll also share at the end of today's presentation. Um, once you re reach out to our team, you'll be assigned a dedicated account manager that will work with you to come up with a plan on how to address your building's needs. And we obviously know that every building in the city is different, so we tailor our, our, our support to your specific project. Lastly, and I think the most important thing, is it doesn't cost you anything to participate. The New York City Accelerator, there's no commitment uh, there's nothing to sign. We're just here for support and assistance. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Eric Jacobs, to dive deeper into our new buildings track. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate everyone uh, joining today. Just going to dig into our new buildings offerings a little more. Yeah, so our, our new buildings track offers assistance throughout all phases of new construction and alteration projects, which include change of use or conversions, which we'll, we'll discuss more in depth later. You know, we're really here to educate and inform new building owners and design professionals on future proofing projects aligned with local laws, code, and increased energy efficiency by focusing on key building milestones. You know, the earlier our team can get involved, whether that be at the pre-development or schematic design stage, the better, as we know that both money and time are, are drivers to investments to build higher performing buildings and where we can help make the most impact. As we'll dive deeper into policy overview shortly, I just wanted to provide a, a brief outline of laws to consider specific to new construction. As we're well aware of Local Law 97, which sets carbon emission thresholds on our city's largest buildings, Local Law 154, or the All Electric Law, is a phase out of fossil fuel based systems affecting buildings less than seven stories this calendar year. Additionally, Local Law 92 and 94 requires all new buildings, including major renovation to existing roofs, must integrate a sustainable roofing system in the form of solar or green roof or a combination of the two. Our team is here to provide technical support and local law compliance, which is realized through one, our ability to offer high level plan review, where our team can help identify various energy conservation measures specific to your building's needs. This is reinforced through our de dedicated financing specialist. New York City Accelerator can help you understand various financing options and identify and connect you with lenders, assessing offers and ongoing support as needed. Furthermore, 
The Accelerator hosts a variety of relevant trainings on many topics, including building energy law compliance, along with cutting edge building standards like Passive House. Next. It should be to help to help meet New York City's ambitious climate goals. Choosing passive house level design or stretch code can help building owners meet those requirements, resulting in benefits such as lowered operational costs, energy consumption, and carbon emissions, while providing tenant comfort and resilience. As future energy codes and stretch codes continue to evolve uh, and move closer to low energy standards. Project teams and building owners that embrace these standards now have the best chance of staying ahead of the curve and position themselves strongly to an easier transition to electrification and avoid future 97 fines. Additional support from our track comes in the form of focused workshop sessions. Uh, these sessions offer a unique opportunity for designers and building owners to delve into topics related to energy efficient building performance measures, such as thermal bridging, air sealing, and net zero energy design. This is a, a practical and collaborative platform for attendees to enhance their skills, their hands-on exercises, and case studies with the hopes of translating and implementing these measures into current or future new construction projects. In addition to our trainings, uh, an important part of the New York City Accelerator is our service provider program. The notion is to really help build the market and not be the market. This is a vetted list of contractors where we connect building decision makers with the appropriate service providers to streamline and implement decarbonization strategies. The service provider role is vital to a more rapid market transformation for the city, including support for job creation, workforce development, economic opportunities with a focus on MWBE engagement. This is important more than ever as we navigate the first compliance here for Local Law 97. This is an opportunity for registered design professionals to help building owners both prepare and file their annual report with the department by May 1st of 2025 for emissions produced in calendar year 24, which, needs, which must be certified by a registered design professional. Your new construction projects and ma major renovation projects will have lasting effect on our city uh, and your bottom line. Planning for energy efficiency measures will, will both increase property value and avoid uh, local law 97 fines associated with local energy laws. Most importantly, the work you're doing today uh, is helping transform the market in which buildings are designed, built, and operated within our city. Uh, in our continual effort to further support professionals like you, we are excited to announce a, a limited time offer, a comprehensive training package um, that qualifies for a variety of AIA continuing education credits, uh, including training on cold climate heat pumps, ventilation strategies, and more. So please reach out and, and schedule a brief call with our team um, to learn more and, and gain, gain access to, to enrollment. So please, yeah, take advantage of, of our resources, our personalized technical assistance, financing assistance for long-term energy planning for 2030 and beyond. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Kenrick now from the Department of Buildings who will be providing a policy overview. Okay, thank you all. Good morning. I trust that we can all see my screen. Yes, looks good, Kenrick. Fantastic. Good morning again, everyone. Um, I'm Kenrick Chai Hong, project manager here at Department of Buildings in the Bureau of Sustainability, uh, specifically in the Outreach and Assistance Unit, headed by Holly Savoya, director. Uh, and she is joining us on this call this morning as well. Thank you for having us, Justin. Thank you, uh, Mike and Eric. Um, my career here at Buildings actually started over 15 years ago as a plan examiner, actually. 
But for the last, I would say a little over 10 years, I've been with the sustainability unit. So today I'm going to give a general overview of these laws, 97, 92, 94, and 154. Um, by way of context and goal, um, not only is local law 97 expected to achieve millions of tons of emission reduction and creating all these thousands of jobs, but also perhaps as importantly, 150 hospitalizations would be avoided per year and up to 130 deaths prevented per year. And I think those are significant. And if we look down here, the local law 97 works with the State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. <clears throat> um, so bottom line is as the grid gets greener and cleaner, more renewable resources will come into play. So if we look at this chart to our right, we see a downward trend of the GHG emissions. So by 2025 to 2030, you could see an acceleration in the reduction and the reduction will continue to zero by 2050. In terms of local law 97, the GHG emissions limits are actually, as was mentioned before, for all buildings greater than 25,000 square feet. And the report should be in May 1st of every year for the prior calendar year. City buildings are supposed to reduce emissions by 40% by 2025 and 50% by 2030. The NYCHA buildings are subject to the same requirements as the private sector, but uh, they comply on a portfolio-wide basis, not on a building-by-building -building basis. Here we see the three compliance parts, annual emissions limits. This is the Article 320 um, encompassing 34,000 buildings. Those are the private sector, non-rent regulated buildings. And second group, Article 321, buildings encompassing 8,500 buildings. These are the rent regulated buildings and the houses of worship. And Article 803, with, which include 5,500 buildings. These are the city buildings and, and NYCHA buildings. These are the compliance pathways that you can reference. The first major 97 rule actually became effective last year, January 19th and offered guidance on calculations, reporting requirements, emissions limits. And as we saw, it's on a 2050 trajectory to zero. Um, the second major rule package includes the penalty framework, the electrification credit, various technical amendments, and the Article 321 requirements for compliance and penalties for non-compliance. Here we see the 320 penalty framework. As we said before, the 320 includes the private sector and non-rent regulated buildings. They have two main compliance responsibilities. To submit the emissions report, there's a penalty for not submitting, and they should meet emissions limits. There's a separate penalty for not meeting the limits. And there are penalty mitigation opportunities, unexpected or unforeseeable event, and good faith efforts to our right. Um, to complete good faith efforts, these three should be completed, and one of these six should be completed. for the decarbonization plan. Sorry, my, my tongue is tied. Uh, these are just the mitigation efforts with specific dates, target dates. For the enforcement framework, if a building is over the emissions limits, um, be is we'd be issuing penalties and mediated resolution. So the penalties will be adjudicated at oath with a DOB enforcement attorney present. And if a building owner does not comply with the terms of the mediated resolution, we DOB can issue back penalties. And there will be special credit for beneficial electrification if owners um, replace the equipment early, they can get double the emissions reductions between 2021 and 2026, and one time the emissions reduction between 2027 and 2029. 
for the Article 321 compliance. Remember, these are the, the rent regulated buildings and the houses of worship. They can meet Article 321 emissions limits this year for 2030, or they can complete these 13 PECMs that you see listed here. There's a one-time report due May 1st of next year. In terms of the 321 compliance, you can see the three parts here, um, including for your reference, but it's based on uh, use characteristics of the buildings. And, and those determine which compliance path uh, is required. Penalty framework. Uh, again, these properties have two requirements. Submit required report is a penalty. And they need to demonstrate compliance. And there's a separate penalty for that. There are penalty mitigation opportunities. Maybe there's an unexpected or unforeseeable event, eligible energy conservation project or, or mediated resolution. Um, so in terms of future things we should expect in the future, uh, we will probably see some rules on cogen or some adjustments and hopefully an alignment of the sustainability laws, right? Just switching gears a little bit. I know um, Eric touched, well, he showed a slide with local law 9294, but let's get into this a little bit. Local law 9294 of 2019 has to do with the sustainable roofing zone requirement in the building code. What we are looking at here is the top of the buildings bulletin 2019-010. At that time, when this came out in October 2019, Melanie LaRocca was the commissioner. But this bulletin seeks to clarify the requirements of local law 92 and 94. Another thing to note, see uh, when this bulletin came out, the building code section in effect at the time, this was for the prior construction codes, the 2014 construction codes, the section was BC 1511. Now with the 2022 construction codes, it's building code section 1512.2. So what we are looking at here is the applicability section of the building's bulletin. Basically, there are three triggers when this sustainable roofing zone is required. One, on new buildings. Two, new roofs resulting from enlargement of existing buildings. Three, existing buildings replacing an entire existing roof deck or roof assembly. What needs to be provided, a PV system, a green roof system, or a combination thereof. If 99% of the roof deck is being replaced, that does not trigger local law 9294 because it's not 100%, right? Um, do you be now online portal for submitting applications will guide you how to apply for this. And there's seven exceptions. We are looking again at the bulletin. This is just, uh, like I said, clarifying the language in the code. So we can see, you know, exceptions, pitch roofs, maybe roof is too steep, recreational spaces, uh, areas occupied by water towers, greenhouses, etc. So let's jump to local law 154. This is known as the building electrification law, also known as the gas ban law. They are contained in two sections of the city's administrative code, Title 24 administered by DEP, Title 28 administered by us, DOB. And essentially what it says 
is that no person shall permit the combustion of any substance that emits 25 kilograms or more of CO2 per million BTUs of energy, as determined by the United States Energy Information Administration. Now, the EIA put out, you know, from time to time, they put out charts of emissions. And back in September 7th of last year, they had a chart that showed natural gas emissions at 52.91, 52.91 kilograms. And that's the reason why it's called the gas ban, because gas, natural gas produces too much emissions, right? Title 28 reiterates the same thing. And of course, there are exceptions to local law 154. Um, buildings used by a regulated utility, you can see them here. Buildings operated by DP, certain spaces like labs, crematoria, commercial kitchens, all can use fossil fuel for these specific uses. And that would be uh, stated in the submission to DOB. Quick timeline, you can see last January this year, this kicked in, this local law 154 kicked in. And as the timeline progresses, different types of buildings and, and occupancies are included. So it's a four year phase out. All right. There's a live banner in DOB Now public portal. So when you click on this banner in the DOB Now public portal, it this pops up, service notices pops up showing you how to, to submit an application that relates to local law 154. Um, so just to reiterate, and well, to state for the first time here, only new buildings or large alterations are required to comply with local law 154. What do we mean by large alterations? Specifically, the job type in the system is called alt CO, new building with existing elements to remain. So it's for NBs and alt CO NBs, not existing buildings. And affordable housing is given more time to comply, as you saw on the chart, and there are exceptions for certain uses. You can get a copy of this information by clicking this link here. Questions can be Thanks. sent. Oops. Yeah, quite these. You can send your questions here. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Kenrick, and sorry to uh, no, no. stepped on your toes a little bit there. No, uh, no, no problem. That was great, and um, I think you covered a lot of great information, and we actually received a question uh, that we'll be discussing in the Q&A portion that I, I think you may have addressed, but if not, we can go back to it uh, when we have the Q&A. Um, okay. With that, um, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Michael Schmidt from Stephen Winters Associates. Um, Michael, if you would like to uh, present, that would Greatly appreciated. Great, thank you, Michael Berry. Uh, just give me one moment to get my slides up here. All right, you should be able to see my slide deck here. Yep, looks great. Great, thanks. And thank you, Michael Berry and, and the rest of the Accelerator for inviting me to speak today at, at this presentation. Um, Kenrick, thank you for sort of laying out the, the policy side um, of some of the local laws. I think, you know, we're going to make a pivot here, at least for my, my presentation, uh, to more of a technical side and, um, you know, real world project where we're applying, uh, you know, energy efficiency measures uh, to, to meet, meet criteria within the local laws. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction. My name is Michael Schmidt. I'm a senior building systems consultant at Stephen Winter Associates. Um, our firm works on a whole host of sustainability um, services, including local law assistance, but um, 
really, I focus on our Passive House team on the development of Passive House projects throughout the city and tri-state area. So, you know, I'm, I'm going to view this through the lens of, of an actual case study, uh, a, a low carbon multifamily design, and we're using Passive House certification um, you know, as a pathway to achieve, um, to achieve those low carbon goals. Just quickly, you'll see this, this image reoccur throughout the presentation, but you know, just to talk a bit about the, um, you know, the different elements of a Passive House project, um, you know, starting here on the left, you know, a, a very well air sealed building envelope is sort of the corner, one of the cornerstones of Passive House certification that you know, ties in with uh, high performance windows and doors, uh, continuous insulation wrapping the entire building, um, a, an eye on thermal bridge and thermal bridge mitigation within the structure, uh, we we've always we're always including you know uh, energy recovery ventilation right we've we've created this airtight chambers box within the building and we want to make sure that we're we're ventilating this uh, you know correctly and, and continuously um, domestic hot water a very efficient domestic hot water system and efficient lights and appliances we will show you some examples through the case study of the Sendero Verde project this is more of a construction update a sort of tales from the trenches to show um, some of the photos that have been taken during during the site to, to demonstrate these metrics. Um, so Sendero Verde is slated to be the largest passive house development in the world, uh, affordable housing development. Um, it is a permanently affordable development uh, developed by l and Partners and, a, and um, a, a, few, a few partners with, with them. It's a series of three buildings here in East Harlem, New York. Um, for some site context, it is located right next to the Hudson line in the back of the buildings you cannot really see in this image. Um, so as far as progress, uh, the two smaller of the buildings uh, were certified in 2020. Uh, they've achieved this, this uh, PHI Passive House certification through the um, uh, Passive House Institute. Um, these are very successful projects. They have been uh, fully occupied and operated for about a year now. Um, and the A building, which is the tallest of, of these, the 35 floor tower here, it's been pre-certified uh, and is, is nearing construction completion. We'll actually be out on site next week to complete the final uh, whole building blower door test for this project. So we're getting very near certification for this project as well. So let's talk about the Passive House design elements of the Sendero Verde project. Um, in a little bit more detail here, starting with the building's air tightness. Um, this is a photo from the whole building blower door test we had done on, on one of the, the, B, the B North building um, that's already been certified. Now, Passive House has a very specific threshold for the air tightness of these, of these structures. Um, 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals is the target uh, for these tests. And you'll note here, you know, the both the North and the South building came in significantly below that target, um, you know, due to the attention to detail throughout construction, um, you know, reinforced with construction inspections and, and um, uh, you know, a, a, a very diligent team, both on the construction front and on the design side. Um, to make a mention to the high performance windows and doors, these are very airtight uh, assemblies. Um, here's a photo from, from on site where we're doing intermediate window testing. These windows really represent a, a large, um, uh, they, they represent a significant amount of linear feet of the building's envelope connections that are you know, field applied. So you know, during construction, we wanna ensure that you know, these targets can be reached. And this is one of the ways that our firm approaches um, you know, that, that surety towards, you know, because the, the final test is really at the, the end of the project, right? Um, so we want to know during construction how we're doing. Um, just a photo of one of the finished apartments showing, you know, a living space in a one bedroom apartment on the South building, um, just to highlight, um, you know, the window and, and, you know, how this apartment looks in, you know, after construction. Um, one of the you know, biggest things you'll notice in these buildings are when you close the windows, how quiet the apartments are. Uh, you don't get any street noise. Um, as I mentioned, the Hudson line is right next to this building. And um, due to that triple pane, highly insulated window um, and, and well air sealed building, you are able to, you know, keep the outside noises outside. And um, this is a, a a nice feature that is sort of an add-on for building to the pass-fails level. 
We'll move here to continuous insulation and thermal bridge free. Uh, this is a photo from the site. Now you can see sort of behind the brick cavity what's there. Um, this is three inches of mineral wool. The R values of these buildings are, are, you know, especially when we're building at scale, are fairly comparable to, you know, what might be required by building energy code. Uh, they are not really above and beyond. Um, the attention to detail is, but the, as far as the overall R values are, are fairly comparable. Um, you can see a few thermal bridge mitigation strategies here, the, the white block below the brick is um, an aerated concrete block, which allows for, for a thermal break from the, the slab below. Um, these, these brick ties that are, that are holding the insulation up with the black heads are um, you know, thermally broken back to the facade. Um, so those are just highlighting a few of those features. Uh, you can also see the red air barrier membrane uh, installed continuously behind. A few other you know, thermal bridge uh, mitigation strategies, all of these projects have rooftop solar um, and the solar dunnage is you know, thermally isolated from the roof deck. So uh, using a, a high, high strength, compressive strength um, insulation product, we're able to, to, to mitigate a thermal bridge in locations like this. Um, and lastly, at those brick shelf angles, which occur on each floor, uh, we're, we're thermally breaking those uh, with a, a a three quarter inch shim or one inch shim uh, from the, the building's facade. And, you know, this really leads to, to improvements in comfort when folks are standing near the, the perimeter of the building, right? They aren't getting cold feet near the, near the windows, right? Um, so those are some of the benefits to a, you know, a thermally broken system. Moving on here uh, to the ventilation system. Uh, all these projects have rooftop dedicated uh, ERV or energy recovery ventilation units. Um, here's just an image of what they might look like. Um, these again are, are thermally broken from the slab, uh, but are, con are providing continuous 24 seven ventilation uh, you know, throughout the entirety of the building spaces. Um, these are, this is done again on a continuous basis. We're exhausting from contaminated areas like the kitchen and bathrooms, and we're supplying to the living spaces. Um, so again, we've built that, that really airtight chamber. We want to ensure that uh, we're continuously ventilating that at a, at a constant rate uh, to, um, to ensure that um, the indoor air quality is, um, is held high. So um, this is also fresh and filtered air. These units have about 80% heat recovery efficiency with, you know, within the technology that's built into these units, they have an energy recovery wheel that's you know, allowing for that recovery um, from the outgoing air, you know, bypassing the, the incoming air. Efficient domestic hot water, you know, as a caveat to this, I'll say uh, these projects were designed in design about eight years ago and are just coming to construction completion, right? So um, this was before a lot of the big electrification pushes by both code and, and certain standards. Um, so these are, all the buildings are fitted with a central gas uh, fired condensing boilers. Uh, they are very efficient for for, for what you're getting. Um, these are IntelliHots and they're about 98% efficient um, of course, we're still burning some carbon, you know, carbon emissions are, are coming from these, but uh, I think you'll see that um, through other efficiency measures, we're able to significantly reduce the load and um, better plan for uh, the, the, the use here. Now, a lot of our projects that are currently in design and are moving into construction now are moving towards a electrified hot water system. So we are seeing this catching on on a, a wide breadth of, of new projects that are uh, you know, coming out of the design pipeline. Also note here uh, that there was a very efficient um, piping design layout uh, for the circulation system. This was able to save about 40% of actual pipe length and uh, we're calling this this box design, um, essentially leads to greater efficiency by you running a, a domestic hot water express and um, uh, loop with a, a consistent um, flow throughout this loop and the apartments tap off of those. So um, this is just a new way of envisioning sort of uh, how domestic hot water is supplied to apartments. Um, this has been working very well on, on all of our projects and is a, a common design feature at this point. Great. I don't have a great photo, but 
you know, of course we're using, you know, LED lighting fixtures, lighting controls where, where applicable, um, you know, accounting for all of the energy use within the building and, and the surrounding, you know, exterior lighting, for example. Um, these are Energy Star appliances within the apartments and um, are, are, you know, further furthering the, the efficiency savings on a, on a building like this. And this is my last slide. You know, I really wanted to tie it back to some of the local laws, and I think we can take a moment to to analyze this uh, this graphic. It's part of an ongoing study our firm is working on to compare um, the utility analysis, the actual energy use of these projects, you know, compared to the local law ninety seven twenty thirty target. So the targets drawn here in a in the red dashed line across the top. We've set two baseline buildings, you know, pre two thousand three and and a post two thousand three building here on the left. Uh, you'll note that those are above, right, exceeding those local law limits. I have one project in here in the orange bar that's showing uh, a non passive house project that we did get utility data to to do this analysis on. Um, and then we're going to show uh, a host of ten passive house projects here and their actual energy use. You know, there's a few caveats, right? you know, these buildings need to be fully occupied. Typically we're, you know, these buildings are operating for, for two years before we can get consistent data. Um, so this is very much still a fresh discussion uh, and it's something that we're continuing an effort on. Uh, this is not related to the Scenario Verde project, but does list uh, several other past you know, completed projects uh, that we do have data for. Um, to make a few other mentions, um, there's, there's a wide breadth of different projects in here and scales, um, some high rise, some more mid-rise projects, um, one low-rise project, and on the far right, 200 Tyler is a a um, a historic uh, re uh, rehab project. So it is an existing building that's been upgraded to the passive house standard. We're showing in blue here the blue bars. Uh, these are projects that have um, that have gas heat. Specifically, some of them, uh, including Beach Green Dune One, has a uh, central um, uh, CPH, um, sorry, combined heat and power system. Um, and then the green bars are showing uh, sort of the more uh, electric buildings. Um, all of these do use uh, ga you know, gas for heating the domestic hot water um, and some gas for the post heat within the ERV unit, but I think is a fairly good sample size. Um, right here in this red box is showing all of the passive house projects and, you know, showing that they're considerably below the, you know, 2030 targets for local law 97. Now, you know, it's a bit hard to see to the future and where those targets might land given, you know, Indian points closing and, um, you know, some adjustments to the actual greenhouse gas emission targets. But I think we're clearly showing a trend here that building to a standard, you know, low energy standard like passive house is a way to achieve uh, these local law um, targets. So with that, I will conclude my slides here. Um, and thank you all for joining. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And this was really great. And it's nice to see the work that, you know, your team's doing in the city. And it's nice to see projects like this, especially up in Harlem. Um, and it's, it's nice to have a point of reference in the city where these buildings are being built. So great job. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Robert Holbrook. Uh, Robert is again from the Mayor's Office of Policy and Planning, and Robert will be our final presenter today before we go to our Q&A. So with that, Robert, I'll hand it off to you. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Confirm everyone can see my screen. Not yet, Robert. How about now? Looks great. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and, and thank you for hosting us. Um, as Michael said, my name is Rob Holbrook. I have the best title in city government. I'm the executive director of Get Stuff Built. I sit at the mayor's office of policy uh, and, and planning. Um, one of my projects in my portfolio is the Office to Residential Conversion Accelerator. Um, we we share uh, one word in our title with uh, New York City Accelerator, where we have a different focus, um, but the, the theme is the same, getting things done faster. Specifically, um, uh, the mayor has tasked us with accelerating office residence conversions. Um, you may have, uh, be aware and sort of a lot of conversation in the public today about office uh, vacancies in, in New York City and across the, the country and the world. Um, 
although New York City has done um, very well in Class A office space um, in the last quarter, we've actually had a had a, had a, a very uh, successful um, quarter of leasing. Um, generally, our office space is experiencing a higher rate of vacancy um, than pre-pandemic. There's just simply a a new reality um, in in how businesses use their spaces, their their footprints, um, and we're trying to write the next chapter of New York City's future. Um, there is a win-win policy perspective on converting those vacant office buildings to residential uses, um, both activating those vacant spaces and, and contributing back to our neighborhoods that need that vitality of activity rather than the blight of empty buildings, as well as providing much needed housing. Um, another part of this story is New York City's need for, for new housing, particularly um, affordable housing. So um, with that, I, I'll, I'll take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about what the Office Conver uh, Conversion Accelerator does. Um, and a couple of other land use um, topics that the city is taking to change regulations to incentivize and, and get government out of the way of the market converting um, office spaces to new residential uses. Um, new York City has a long history of uh, adaptive reuse and particularly um, in, our, in our central business districts. Um, this, this is a, a map showing um, conversions of vacant or underutilized office uses over the past 10 years. Um, both in residential uses and conversions to hotel. Uh, we're very specific that we're just looking at office buildings. There's generally a conversation about converting um, hotels to residential uses, which is not captured here. Um, so that does also occur, uh, but we're mostly focused strictly on our, our vacant office buildings. Um, and again, looking back, there has been a very successful history here um, over the, sort of the 10 years from 2010 to 2020, we had about 4,000 units. Um, most of those, uh, before that, we're done under a tax payment program in Lower Manhattan. So you'll see sort of a, a, a focus of blue dots in Lower Manhattan that happened under that program. Um, and there's also a regulatory reason for that that I'll get into in a little bit later. Um, so generally, this is a, a history of past successes in this in this uh, industry. Um, office building reuse can look uh, like a lot of different things. Here are some examples of uh, pre-COVID um, conversions that have happened. Um, both office to residential, like one Wall Street, uh, which is uh, right down the street from me, um, office to hotel, and then office to other uses. Um, and occasionally, uh, there are also partial conversions um, where some of the building is kept as office use with one lobby with a, an, a, an additional lobby serving the residential uses. Um, right. So um, my experience, and I think I think most of people are aware of this, is there 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 are. Um, sort of uh, a spectrum of office buildings uh, conditions on these existing buildings, some of which are easier. And I, and I use that term loosely easier to convert than others. Um, this is an example of, of one of those buildings that lays out quite well for residential uses, um, uh, yeah. narrow corner lots that can provide lots of light and air uh, for apartments uh, surrounding the existing core. Um, this is another example that was a bit more complicated um, with these larger floor plate um, buildings, often there needs to be a light well or courtyard carved into the middle of the building to provide legal windows into sort of the interior of those floor plates. Um, so generally there's a, a, a much uh, more significant scope of work and construction. Um, sometimes the window uh, punch ups need to be completely replaced to provide operable windows. Uh, that is a requirement for residential uses that is not required for commercial uses. Um, so the mayor has acknowledged that the construction process in New York City is complicated and difficult to navigate. I think uh, no surprise on most of the folks on this call who are professionals in this world. Um, and I've been tasked with setting up a accelerator to assist building owners who are converting their, their vacant offices to residential uses. Um, our accelerator can be reached at the um, website here, nyc.gov slash office conversion. So if you are uh, considering a conversion project or are in the process of, of planning or submitting for one, um, please reach out to us. Um, we So a, a summary of what we do, we provide timeshare services of not navigating our permitting agencies. Um, this is an exercise in communication. We do not have the ability to waive code or change uh, zoning requirements. This is an exercise in communication, making sure that uh, developers and builders are getting clear um, messaging and, and, and quick responses from our permitting agencies who still ultimately have the responsibility of issuing permits and determinations. Um, we do ask, uh, and I'm a little bit loose on this, but we are generally seeking larger projects, um, 50 or more units. Um, 
uh, still reach out to me if you don't meet that criteria, but I, I'd love to hear about your projects. Just make sure that we know um, what we're doing. We do uh, provide some level of confidentiality with those uh, building owners, um, understanding that um, there may be commercial harm to them uh, as they're doing diligence and considering their options, they may not have made a decision that. Um, so we do make sure that stays within um, uh, our office. Um, we had a, um, a lot of interest. We've got over 50 projects have reached out to us. Um, those projects sort of come in three buckets, uh, which we, 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 we work in different ways. So in the earliest stage, um, projects are usually working on diligence questions, sort of understanding what a residential floor plate would look like in a conversion process and that they can understand what their financial implications, both to understand the capital costs and the revenue costs uh, to, to, to finance those, those capital costs. Um, so that can take quite a while. You know, the, this is a very complicated process um, and the code uh, provisions that lead to a residential floor plate um, diagram, even at a very high level, um, often take some back and forth with Department of Buildings interpretations or planning, planning commission questions. Um, following that sort of diligence and design process, uh, we have some projects that are currently pursuing approvals that can be anywhere from a planning commission approval to a landmarks preservation commission approval. Um, our role is just to track and make sure that those are staying on track. Um, you're getting communication quickly and efficiently from those agencies, scheduling interdivisional meetings, things like that that have to happen in a, in a, in a regular permit review process. And then finally, in a more intense way, once these projects get into construction, and we do have uh, um, several projects in the city currently under construction, um, we think that there'll be about 2,000 uh, units in the next um, the 12 months calendar year uh, that come online. Um, so there is a lot of work going on in construction. Um, that work is more of a day-to-day -day basis on whatever comes up. Um, often there needs to be communication between the agencies. Maybe we need a street opening permit. Um, or um, some sort of inspection from department buildings, all of those things, making sure that they get scheduled and, and are effectively kept on. Um, so the city also recognized that our zoning codes are complex and somewhat outdated um, in the role of office conversions. The diagram that you see on the screen right now is a geographic map of the eligibility rules of Public One, uh, Chapter 5 of our zoning resolution that provides a more flexible um, regulations for conversions um, that, are, that are that are a different standard for envelope and other issues than for new construction. Um, it's a patch quilt work. Um, it, it does not make a lot of logical sense. Um, as, as you can see, the dark green is sort of the most permissive areas of buildings uh, that are eligible for those rules that are 1977 and older. And then the light green is the, the rest of 1962 or older. Um, uh, we recognize that this doesn't make a lot of sense and we're bringing those up to date um, through a couple of actions. Uh, the first will be the City of Yes Housing Opportunity Zoning Text Amendment, which is a citywide text amendment um, that will be going into a Uniform Land Use Review Procedure approval um, uh, this spring. And, and that will expand those eligibility rules across the city uh, in all commercial districts um, that allow residential uses as well as bringing up the eligibility uh, timing of those rules to 1990 older buildings. Um, that will increase the eligibility of uh, buildings by approximately 130 million square feet of uh, buildings that were built, uh, you know, that are not eligible today that would be under these proposed changes. So that's a significant increase in the eligibility. Again, we do not think that all of those buildings are ripe for conversion. Um, some of them will have uh, significant capital costs that may be prohibitive to conversion. Some of them will be easier to, to, to convert. Um, another couple of small tweaks to the conversion regulations um, where there are currently parking requirements uh, for conversions uh, we'll be removing them also providing options for rooming units that is different from dwelling units and a couple of other small changes those text um, changes will be um, announced uh, shortly in a couple of months um, those will become out, out in the public again that is part of a larger text amendment uh, to uh, provide opportunities for more housing growth even in new construction as well across the city um, and I'm sure there will be a lot of more conversation about that in the next um, calendar year. Following that, uh, we are also seeking a neighborhood rezoning changes in the last remaining manufacturing districts in Midtown. Um, the Midtown South mixed use plan is looking at these four manufacturing districts with the intent of allowing mixed use, including office conversions in these areas. Uh, that's on a separate time frame of the neighborhood rezoning. Um, so we're looking at that to begin. Um, Sometime in 2025. Uh, I, I put links in both of those um, planning projects from the Planning Commission's uh, website, um, Midtown South Plant on NYC, 
and nyc.gov slash yes has an opportunity if you want to follow along with that. Um, I put this slide in here just to briefly mention uh, White House issued a um, commercial residential conversion guidebook for federal funding opportunities. Um, those are three of the, I think, 24 um, issues that they were identified. And these are federal funding opportunities. They do come with some commitments and requirements um, in addition to opportunities like tax credits for historic buildings that were already in place. Um, so you can take check that link to see those uh, funding opportunities. Um, a quick quick mention of Landmarks Preservation Commission, as many of these are older buildings that are either individual designated landmarks or in um, historic districts. Uh, there has been a history of successful conversion of landmark buildings. Um, uh, landmarks has uh, oversight over approximately 200 buildings, so that is a significant um, uh, portfolio. Um, here is one process I mentioned one Wall Street earlier. Um, again, it uh, received a certificate of uh, appropriateness and was uh, successfully converted. Um, uh, here's another 70 Pine Street. This also received those federal historic tax credits that I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, office conversion and adaptive reuse is, is a long part of the story of New York City. Um, we have reinvented ourselves from industrial buildings that have become office buildings, and now we are reinventing the next chapter in that story as we change these office buildings into um, our much needed residential uses. So we're very excited on this uh, policy perspective and hoping to see more work in this area in the future. So with that, uh, I think we're going to questions. Um, I'll give it back to Michael Bear. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. And you do actually have the coolest title in the city right now. So I'm very jealous. Um, right now, we're going to uh, switch over to some questions. Um, I have um, received, we've actually received quite a few questions. So I'm going to start at the top. Um, our first question, I'm going to ask Eric Jacobs from our team to respond to. For architects specializing in sustainability interventions, how can the New York City Accelerator assist in connecting with building owners in need of interventions? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, you know, I think this goes back to to our service provider program, you know, the importance of, of adding design professionals and architects. It's an opportunity to expand your business by connecting you with building owners and developers who are sp seeking specific sustainable sustainability services. So I, I just would recommend and reaching out to New York City Accelerator and, you know, we can have a better understanding of like what your capabilities are. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have another question, um, and uh, I think we'll ask, see if Kenrick or Holly may have a response to this. Is there an emissions report template professionals can use when submitting? So I'm assuming that you're speaking about Local Law 97, and yes, there will be a format to submit for your building, and that will be on DOB now, and there will be filing guides that are associated with that. So you'll get information about how to do that. Okay, great. Um, and I think if you wanna stay on Holly, I think this might be another question you might be able to assist with. Um, I have a rent stabilized building. I understand that there are 13 things I have to comply with to satisfy local law 97. Do you have somebody who can assist me with this or, or who has who has to certify this uh, and how does it get done? Right. So um, the, the PECMs have to be um, witnessed and certified by a qualified retro commissioning agent. Um, in the chat, I would be happy to drop our um, Article 321 filing guide, um, which would give you all the information you need to know about that. And um, also there is a, a webinar coming up about PCMs next week, which will go into each one in detail. And I think we could probably drop the information about that webinar um, in the chat as well. Yeah, that'd be great uh, and very helpful. Um, I think this was really covered in Kenrick's slides, but um, about the question was about natural gas systems included in this electrification plan. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, again, Holly or Kenrick, if you guys want to talk a little bit more in depth, I think the um, timeline you showed showed the the, the way that the, the 154 progresses and how it addresses um, natural gas um, systems that are in these projects. But I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add um, in the role of natural gas systems going into 154. 
So the first thing that people need to know is that it's, it's only for new buildings, only for new construction, right? And secondly, um, there is a timeline. So as of January 1st of this year, it was for buildings that were less than seven stories. Um, and then it phases in other buildings over time. Great. So I think when you get a copy of, of the slides, you can see, you can address that further or investigate that further. But also on our website, we also have information about um, building electrification. Awesome. Yeah, and I think that's a great resource. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I know we've fielded a lot of questions through the accelerator on um, what the role is of natural gas systems in these pro new construction projects moving forward under local law 154. Um, I think for the next question, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask Michael Schmidt to come online. Um, Michael, um, we have a question. Um, could you let us know some of the challenges that you face with this with the Sandro Verde project and is there any lessons learned or best practices that you could share with participants um, on this project? Sure I think thank you Michael that that's a great question. Um, I'll say there there's quite a number um, you know I think really it starts with the education of the of the contractors uh, being that this was a multiple phase project we had the same contractors on the first buildings we were able to work out a lot of the details a lot of the issues uh, and move those throughout the other you know the other you know the rest of the development um so that was you know we were able to really stem those issues through working with the team and the same team which is really valuable and you know lnm partners and lnm builders at this point are you know sort of a dream team as far as construction um staff but you know we have a lot of projects that don't have that level of experience and i think it really just starts with educating both the general contractors and the subcontractors about these project goals as far as sustainability and energy efficiency are related so um that's you know part of our typical services on any of our projects but uh, i would i would encourage you to engage a you know a consultant that's you know has that experience to bring to you know to the contractors who will be building it um i think that's probably the most invaluable piece of information i could give um awesome that that's great and again we like the with the accelerator we'd like to point to uh projects like this in the city where they've where you've been able to do this, especially because people will ask us, has it been done? And is, what challenge are faced? So we really appreciate the feedback. Um, I think we're gonna now pivot. Um, Robert, uh, we had a couple of questions about the um, office uh, to residential conversions. Um, the first question, given the substantial increase in residential units resulting from office building conversions, could you elaborate on any strategies or incentives the mayor's office of policy or planning is considering to ensure that these conversions also prioritize energy efficiency, sustainability measures to effectively reduce carbon emissions in the city? Sure, so I think that conversion process is a um, significant opportunity to meet those local, local law 97 future goals. Um, and of course, like I said, the, 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 this is a significant LCO application, so those, those rules um, are in, in effect for the spaces that are under conversion. And in fact, I think you can, can help me with this, that there's actually um, some um, requirements that uh, apply to the existing commercial rules uh, spaces that are left over. Um, so um, yes, as, as you know, this is more of an opportunity um, for those building owners to make these upgrades uh, earlier uh, than the requirement uh, kicking in. Um, but there is no necessarily um, uh, earlier standard um, rule other than uh, it is generally always cheaper to uh, pay to do the upgrade now rather than to do it uh, years later. I can probably promise you that's, that's going to be the case across the board. Great. Yeah, and one more question for you. Um, with the Office Conversion Accelerator Program facilitating numerous conversions, how does the mayor's office of policy and planning plan to address the potential challenges associated with maintaining compliance with local building laws, especially concerning safety and structural integrity, while also encouraging the transition to more sustainable and environmentally friendly residential spaces? Um, That's a lot. It's a lot of question right there. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think I generally covered this. Uh, I want everyone to be very clear that yeah. these conversion projects are still subject to our underlying code requirements and our and our building safety standards. Um, so these are not small, easy projects. You are still going into for a full um, major renovation um, project. We're still subject to multiple dwelling law 
um, anything that is required uh, under that dwelling law for habitation um, is triggered by these LCO applications. Um, so that may be, you know, a significant overhaul over um, mechanical uh, plumbing and uh, access issues like elevators need to be part of the code. Um, so we are in no way undermining our safety standards um, by providing these conversion opportunities. Um, but this is a way to capitalize those uh, investments into a, a project. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for your responses. Um, we do have two more questions. And I would ask folks, if you have any uh, participants on today's webinar, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if not, we'll go to the next question. And then we'll probably wrap after the, the second question that we have. Uh, the next question we have is, um, once I comply with 13 items, do I self-certify or do I hire somebody to certify for me? If I have to hire somebody, could you refer me to somebody once I comply with all 13 items uh, uh, that I finish for local law 97 and make sure that I'm exempt from fines? Um, Eric, I don't know if this is something you would like to touch upon. Or, or Holly, I see some folks coming off. Yeah, um, it, it's again, it's a you need to have a registered um, a qualified retro commissioning agent to submit the the attestation for you. Um, and then some of the PCMs also require some um, additional uh, backup documentation. And you could see that in um, the filing guide that we have. Um, I dropped it in the chat where it is on our web page. And also, you know, the webinar I mentioned that's happening next week, we'll, we'll go into that as well. Awesome. Um, yeah, and we'll go to our last question if there's no others, and I think this is a good one to end on because we've had a lot of questions at uh, the accelerated fields about local law 92 and 94 compliance. Um, are purple roofs acceptable for local law 92 and 94 compliance? And I don't know if uh, Kenrick or Holly would like to feel this one. I have to say, I don't know what a purple roof is. <laughs> yes, I was I'm not sorry. going to. to <laughs> yeah. What, what do we mean sorry. by purple roof? Uh, that is a great question. Um, and that was the only part, that was the only question we received. So um, if, Eric, I saw that you came on as well. Uh, do you have any uh, purple roof experience? I don't have personal purple roof experience, but uh, it is technically a green roof that optimizes stormwater retention, so detention and retention. Um, I know that there are certain, you know, area, floor area thresholds that need to be met um, to, per to implement either a green roof or solar. Um, so I would assume, depending on the ap applicable floor area uh, that is available, um, you should be able to uh, comply. Yes, and if uh, folks have any more information about Purple Roofs, please feel free, feel free to share it with us. We'd be interested to learn more. Um, we did receive one more question, and I think it's kind of a follow-up from the second to last question, and that's once I comply with the 13 items, am I done with 97 compliance? So um, if you fall under the category of buildings that has to complete the PECM, it's a one-time filing in um, May of 2025. Um, however, if the building at any point in time changes um, from being an affordable housing um, building or a house of worship to another use, then it may be subject to other portions of Local Law 97 that apply to those other types of space uses. Great. That's great. And um, I wanted to take a moment because I think that was our last question. Um, I want to take a moment and thank uh, presenters today. Um, I would like to also thank everyone who uh, attended uh, today's webinar. Um, I think, uh, I hope everyone walked away with learning something new and get to see um, what was really going on in the city today with new construction. Um, I would encourage folks uh, who attended today's uh, webinar uh, to please reach out to the New York City Accelerator or to the, any of the presenters today. Um, and I'd like to thank them again for their time and providing their resources and also their contact information. Uh, we will be following up after this as well with uh, folks that attended today's um, webinar with some additional information. 
Um, we would also like to encourage um, project teams or people working on new projects in the city to reach out to Erica and or I to discuss your projects. We also have an upcoming webinar um, in April. Um, more to be coming out on that uh, through social media, and we'll be also uh, advertising that later this month. Uh, and that will be focused on financing, which I think is obviously a key area where people have a lot of um, interest. Um, also, as Eric mentioned, we have um, a great training series um, that we would encourage you if you're interested in learning more about it, please reach out to us. If you have any projects, what we're doing is if you bring us a project, we'll uh, get you access to those trainings. And I think you'll find that it's a really great resource. Um, also, um, the uh, webinar that Holly mentioned uh, is in the chat. There's a link to that. Please definitely try to uh, uh, attend. Uh, there's a lot of great information in the city right now, a lot of great training, a lot of great resources, and we encourage you to uh, reach out to our team or any of today's presenters. Um, again, I would like to thank everyone for attending today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to working with you in the near future.